Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. This is now an event of the International Society for EVs, ISEV. And I am Kenneth Whitwer. I am the Chair of Science and Meetings for ISEV. And we've been doing this series since the, since the pandemic hit um, in, in many parts of the world last year. And this week, we have a special edition of the EV Club in which we are going to be speaking with Edwin Vanderpoel and Joshua Welsh. Josh and Edwin, over to you. All right, thank you very much, Ken, for the introduction. Um, my name is Edwin, and uh, uh, yeah, this is a dual uh, 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 presentation, so let me start uh, introducing uh, Joshua Welsh, uh, the second speaker of today. So, uh, yeah, Joshua graduated in 2016, uh, and his thesis was named uh, Flow Cytometry Optimization and Standardization of the Study of EVs as Translational Biomarkers. Uh, but uh, even uh, long before that, he was already fighting for uh, improving the standardization of, uh, of EV flow cytometry. Uh, he did that then from uh, Southampton, uh, but now he became a research fellow at uh, the NIH. And uh, yeah, at conferences, you can recognize Josh uh, as he is uh, not too shy to ask a critical question, and he does that uh, usually in a very uh, eloquent way. Um, yeah, given his track record here on the right and, and his affiliations, uh, yeah, it, it's clear uh, yeah, he uh, likes vesicles and flow cytometry. And he told me he is interested in education, but besides that, his main job is uh, yeah, to, uh, to focus on developing a prognostic cancer biomarkers. Uh, so that about Josh. Uh, yeah, my own name is, uh, is Edwin. Um, my function is, uh, in fact, extracellular vesicle detective. Um, I work in the biomedical engineering and physics department and the laboratory of experimental clinical chemistry of the Amsterdam UMC, University Medical Centers. And I'm involved in uh, many projects uh, about standardization uh, uh, of vesicle assays, vesicle flow cytometry, but also uh, utilizing vesicles as biomarkers for disease. And here on the right, you can see uh, the topic of my thesis, uh, which is uh, obviously also about uh, detection. Of EVs, and I, I think that's a, a, yeah a broader ambition which uh, many of us share is uh, is probably the development of a, a vesicle based uh, liquid biopsy, and and in my view that, that would look uh, like something something like this. So we we draw blood from a, a patient, uh, then uh, generally we remove the cells, uh, and, and after that uh, I probably stain. Uh, vesicles of interest and, and then determine their concentration in, in terms of vesicles per milliliter. And if we, we are able in the future to make reference values, reference hematology uh, values, for example, uh, then we could compare the measurement of a patient to this reference, uh, reference hematology paper. And that would look something like this. These are fictive values uh, derived from uh, best estimates uh, from, from the data in my thesis. Uh, but just to, to give an impression where I hope the field is, uh, is going to. And of course, all to provide in the end physicians with better uh, information, better clinical information about the patient. Um, yeah, it sounds so easy, but uh, it, it is not uh, because EVs are, are small and then they are heterogeneous. So here you can see a size distribution of uh, vesicles, in this case uh, from urine. Uh, and it's clear that the majority of vesicles is uh, smaller than 200 nanometers. Please notice that, that the vertical scale here is a, is a logarithmic scale. Uh, so this scale there. And um, yeah, they are small. So uh, yeah, compared to the wavelength of visible uh, light, for example, uh, in this case, uh, a wavelength typically used in, in closed cytometers, vesicles are much smaller. And uh, in contrast to what you read a lot in the literature, this is in fact no problem uh, to detect vesicles with a, a wavelength which is longer. Uh, only we cannot easily form an image, but we can still uh, detect the presence. So for flow cytometry, this is uh, this is not a problem, uh, although you see that in the literature. And um, yeah, vesicles are heterogeneous, so you see this mix with of uh, this candy mix here on the right. Uh, and and of course we want to know the concentration of all these different types of uh, candy. And, and that I think is a nice analogy of uh, uh, the problem that we have with flow cytometry. We want to differentiate the different EV types, and especially 
uh, kind of perhaps the, the rare EVs. And, and flow cytometry uh, yeah, is a candidate technology for that. And, and I think uh, a promising technology because uh, in a flow cytometer, part, particles are hydrodynamically focused, illuminated by a laser beam. And then uh, different optical signals are being measured of these particles uh, one by one. Uh, and that can be done very rapidly. And with rapidly, I mean, uh, typically uh, several thousands per second uh, for cells. Even 100,000 cells per second is, uh, is technically uh, feasible. And um, yeah, regarding the signals, we can measure light scattering, uh, which correlates with uh, uh, optical properties of the particles, such as the refractive index and the diameter. So this is information that you can potentially uh, deduce from your sample. And fluorescence, and fluorescence is of interest, for example, uh, to do uh, fluorescent antibody labeling, uh, thereby being able to, uh, to detect uh, the presence of certain uh, antigens, for example, on the surface of EVs. Now also, flow cytometry sounds like, uh, like an easy job, uh, but it has uh, uh, several problems which are hampering, especially the detection of, of vesicles. And one problem is that the data a flow cytometer provides are in arbitrary units. So here you can see this side scatter, intensity versus the forward scatter intensity of, uh, in this case, vesicles from an erythrocyte uh, concentrate. And uh, this was measured with an apogee, a 50 micro, and on the right with the BED fraction canton 2. And all that the sample was the same, and both flow centimeters uh, used their optimal settings for uh, detection of small particles. The results look entirely different and are not comparable especially because these data have arbitrary units. Uh, yeah, a second problem is, is uh, yeah, instruments, uh, flow cytometers differ in sensitivity. So uh, back to the size distribution of a size distribution of vesicles, with, uh, the shape is quite typical for what we see in body fluids. Uh, again, the vertical scale is a logarithmic scale. And if we now uh, we take two flow cytometers with a different limit of detection, so one flow cytometer is able of detecting 500 nanometer uh, vesicles in larger, and another flow cytometer capable of 160 nanometer vesicles in larger. And these two flow cytometers would differ, or would measure a 30 fold difference in concentration, only because their detection limit is different. Um, of course, that, that's a big difference, but even if flow cytometers differ uh, uh, not that much in sensitivity, in this case, uh, just 20 nanometer, uh, you can in certain circumstances already have a two-fold difference in concentration, for example, in this here. And that's just uh, because this curve is so steep. So uh, yeah, from this plot, it's clear that, that uh, if you want to compare your flow cytometry data, you really need to know exactly where your uh, detection limit is. Now, due to these, uh, these problems, uh, the clinical reality is, uh, is uh, at the moment as such that reported concentrations of, uh, for example, blood plasma vesicles differ more than a million uh, and here on the right, you can see uh, what we name Gonzatska's law. Uh, the platelet vesicle concentration in, uh, in plasma uh, from literature values over time. And you can clearly see that uh, for only a specific vesicle type, uh, you see already uh, around a thousand fold differences. Uh, and, and what we also see is that uh, the, in, the concentration increases over time. And that's probably because flow cytometers become more and more sensitive over time. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, at the moment, clinical data cannot be compared. Uh, so it's, it's obvious from, from this plot alone that uh, standardization is, is required. Uh, solutions for that are uh, at hand, uh, and some are already uh, uh, implemented at the moment in the field. Uh, and and yeah, a first step is to report all experimental details. There is a, a general reproducibility crisis in the, in the biosciences field. Uh, and if we start reporting all essential details about the flow cytometry experiment and all the pre-analytical variables, uh, it's much easier to understand what people have done. Um, in addition, uh, perform assay controls uh, specific for physical flow cytometry and calibrate it. 
So, so I will talk about uh, the reporting and the essay controls today, and then Joshua will take over and uh, will explain to you uh, what we mean with calibration. Uh, regarding the reporting, um, yeah, uh, we started a, a work group, a physical flow cytometry work group several years ago, uh, and we decided uh, uh, that it would be good uh, to publish a framework about the standardized reporting of EV flow cytometry experiments. Um, uh, this was not a, a highly original idea because a MyFlow site uh, already existed. existed. Uh, MyFlow site uh, was a document uh, which was published uh, uh, by the uh, International Society of Advanced Cytometry about uh, which information is recommended to, to publish about the flow cytometry experiment. Um, yeah, vesicle flow cytometry is so specific that we thought there is a need for uh, an addition or at least, yeah, an extension of this, uh, which became a MOFRA, MIFRA EV. Uh, so, so what is this document? So here on the right, you can see uh, the basic outline. Uh, it contains uh, seven sections. Uh, the first section uh, discusses uh, pre and medical variables in experimental design. And, and second section, sample preparation and these uh, allow others to repeat your essay. Uh, then there's a section about essay control uh, and they focus on providing evidence uh, that you're really looking at, at single EVs. Uh, for section four and five about instrument calibration, data acquisition and vesicle characterization. Uh, yeah, these sections uh, allow others to validate data across instruments and, and settings. And uh, yeah, then the final two sections are about the uh, flow cytometry data reporting and sharing, uh, and that's to increase uh, the transparency on data quality uh, and the method of analysis. So, um, yeah, then this whole uh, framework was uh, uh, developed uh, by uh, actually three different of by by scientists from the three different societies: uh, the Society, uh, the International Society of EVs. Uh, but also the International Society of Advanced Cytometry and the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis. And that, that was quite special to bring all those uh, different scientists with different perspectives together. Uh, and in the end, it was published as an ISAF position paper. Uh, and and uh, yeah, the main goal is uh, yeah, to outline the minimum requirements to consider and report when carrying out a single closure cytometry experiment. So, it's not necessarily a, a guideline, uh, but it's uh, yeah, it's rather a recommendation what to report. And, and, and by, by reading this, uh, you will probably consider many things which you can do to improve your address. So this, uh, yeah, this MyFlow site EV was created, uh, a framework for standardized reporting of EV flow cytometry experiments. But uh, yeah, the next step is uh, to get EV scientists to uh, to use it, and, and actually we discover that that people don't use it at least not the way we intended it to be. Uh, so so yeah, hence I will emphasize it in this uh, in this presentation, of course, um, because I I checked every single citation at uh, May 10th, just just two months ago. And uh, thank you very much. We were, of course, very happy with, uh, with having 42 uh, citations. Uh, that's not a problem. Uh, but none of these sites uh, actually used uh, the, uh, the MyFlow ITV template as it uh, should be, except uh, people from the working group themselves. So, um, so what do people do? Um, yeah, actually, I, I was <laughs> quite surprised with in the field of uh, EVs, uh, apparently we write a lot of reviews. So here you can see uh, all the uh, 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 yeah, a pie diagram of these 42 citations. And uh, yeah, 21 of these citations were actually from uh, a review. So uh, yeah, a review doesn't generate uh, original data. So of course, you're not going to fill out any uh, a template about physical process. Um, then eight articles were from work group members and they included uh, the template, they filled it out. Then, um, yeah, actually, uh, there were no original articles uh, from other scientists than were group members who filled out the template. Uh, uh, unfortunately, hence zero. Um, and there were some original articles, uh, but they unfortunately did not use the template. They, uh, yeah, they cited this, uh, but they did not fill out the details which uh, we think 
uh, are useful to share with others to, to reproduce the results. So, um, yeah, then the question, how should my flow site EV uh, be used? Uh, yeah, preferably uh, uh, read over the manuscript if you do a flow cytology experiment, um, but then also download the my flow site EV template. It's just in the supporting information. Uh, you can find it in the Journal of Extracellular Vesicle uh, and fill out the template and add the template to the article supporting information. Um, yeah, and Josh will later on in his presentation show you an example of how to fill out this template based on a, a real study. Um, yeah, filling out the template uh, takes, of course, time. So, so then the question, what is in for you, right? Now, um, yeah, we think uh, at first it may be a reminder of some essential experimental steps because uh, yeah, there are many controls you you might have uh, you may have overlooked uh, or you have may have overlooked uh, a calibration step, uh, so you can just see it as a reminder of, of these experimental steps. Uh, in addition, in our own lab, it really helps to document uh, uh, all the details of what we do, uh, and that uh, doesn't only allow other labs to reproduce our experiments, uh, but also is very handy for internal use to, to see what we have done. Um, yeah, and that generates in the end, of course, also more reliable EV data. Um, yeah, and, and as a reminder, these assay controls um, yeah, also may, may lead to more reliable EV data. Uh, and uh, yeah, the calibration steps which are outlined in the MyFlowSight EV may further improve data interpretation and comparison. Um, yeah, in the end, uh, and all this together may lead to a faster review procedure. Uh, this is because uh, yeah, members of, of the EV uh, flow cytology work group are uh, reviewing a considerable amount of EV flow cytology papers. Um, internally, we, uh, we did a small survey and we asked each other the question, uh, what we find important uh, to report. And several aspects which are mentioned in the MyFlowSight EV, we find all important and, and we all um, would ask uh, people in the field to, to uh, yeah, share those details when they publish the management. So if you do this on forehand, of course, it saves time. So what's in for the field? Um, yeah, I think generating reproducible data in itself uh, is something that uh, any field should strive for. Um, above all, because this brings consensus, uh, think about new isolation methods, uh, new pre-analytical uh, pre variables, uh, optimizing those. Uh, if we all share uh, these details uh, in a calibrated fashion, uh, yeah, that will bring consensus and consensus uh, leads to innovation. You get more structured methods, reliable data, this saves everybody in the field time uh, and will allow us to disseminate our ideas and knowledge. Uh, thereby uh, gaining trust, for example, trust uh, at, in the clinic, right? Uh, before doctors want to invest in your uh, physical essay, you need to have a, a rigid essay. Uh, and that in the end for the field would, uh, would lead to long-term sustainability. So when starting to use my flow site TV, um, I think one year ago when it was published, uh, so I, I really encourage people uh, to use it. Uh, uh, for all the reasons uh, just mentioned. Uh, then uh, I would like to focus uh, shortly on, uh, on the assay controls. Um, I will discuss that, but I will uh, use some slides from Verata, uh, who presented this at, uh, at the ISAF workshop, which we gave uh, a few months ago. So the assay controls are uh, the third section in the MyFlowSight EV uh, document. And uh, yeah, the goal of assay controls is to prove that what you detect are actually single vesicles. Um, yeah, as discussed before, flow cytometers uh, by themselves provide uh, uh, arbitrary unit data. And uh, often the plot uh, looks something like this. Uh, I got this from, uh, from Vera, it is very creative, I think. Uh, and, and the goal of assay controls, once again, are you seeing what you think you're seeing, uh, such that it's not only uh, Belief. Um, now, so here you can see a typical workflow in a flow cytometry experiment. 
So from the samples perspective, uh, the sample uh, comes from a specific source. Uh, you may isolate an EV or, uh, for example, remove cells and concentrate them. Uh, you may uh, uh, dilute them before you stain. Uh, for some samples, this is not needed. For others, it can come in handy. Then you apply your staining, your, you add your reagents. Uh, you may remove your unbound reagents or uh, dilute further in, in, in your measurements. That's something like this is, is quite a typical workflow for a classical sample measured by flow cytometry. So where do the assay controls come in? Uh, now, for example, one may come in here, uh, and, and, and this one is called the serial dilution. It's pointing to uh, the places in this flow diagram where you uh, may dilute your sample. And the reason to do uh, serial dilutions is to confirm the absence of swarm detection, uh, one of the artifacts which may happen if you do a flow cytometry. Uh, what is this, the swarm detection? Uh, so I, I will try uh, to explain that based on a, a very old slide. Uh, this was one of the first slide, uh, slides I made for about swarm detection. And uh, so here on the left, you can see uh, the size distribution of uh, this very sample, which was measured to, to confirm swarm detection. Uh, so uh, we quantified by calibrating the limit of detection of this flow cytometer. And at very, very best, this flow cytometer could detect 360 nanometer vesicles. Um, however, if we measured vesicles from urine, uh, with this flow cytometer, and we filtered the urine with a 220 nanometer filter, uh, thereby uh, having uh, only uh, particles smaller than 220 nanometer urine left, uh, we could still see counts that were substantially above the background uh, and, and uh, signal wise as well as count wise. So uh, we were a bit puzzled in the beginning by this, uh, but it turned out that. Uh, yeah, very high concentrations of vesicles uh, could uh, still exceed the detection threshold of the flow cytometer and thereby being counted as a single event. Also, Veratan made a nice schematic about this. So here you can see uh, in blue uh, the place where the laser beam would illuminate the flow cell and the flow cytometer normally is of course made to detect cells. So uh, these dimensions overlap so you don't easily have more than one cell in the laser beam. It could happen, of course, but then uh, we name this coincidence detection. We are typically talking about a few cells, um, but what may happen with uh, small particles, submicron particles like viruses or extracellular vesicles uh, at physiological concentrations, uh, you may have a, a continuous stream of these small particles uh, present uh, of in the uh, in the focused laser beam of your flow cytometer, and uh, yeah, that is coincidence detection. Actually, it's it's an extreme version of coincidence detection, especially because it's continuously present, and hence we named it then swarm detection. So, um, so what's now the control? How can you check that swarm detection is uh, not hampering your measurement? Uh, now, a very simple uh, procedure is just to uh, do serial dilutions of your sample. So here you can see uh, the measured concentration of particles uh, versus the, um, yeah, here on the top axis versus the dilution. So uh, the further we dilute, uh, no, <laughs> to the left you dilute more and to the right you dilute less. So you expect to measure higher concentrations on the right. All scales are logarithmic scales. And um, of course, you expect a linear relationship between the two, uh, but in practice, you don't find this. And depending on the electronics of your uh, flow cytometer, you will see that at a certain moment uh, in the region where swarm detection starts to happen, uh, yeah, your concentration goes up or down. And um, another way to confirm that this is due to the swarm detection uh, and not, for example, due to the maximum acquisition rate of your electronics, uh, is to uh, measure the median scatter, or it could also be the median fluorescent signal uh, from your population of particles. And um, yeah, if you dilute your sample, uh, the median should not change all too much because uh, if you measure uh, thousands and thousands of particles, uh, the median signal wouldn't be altered by, by uh, measuring a different amount of those particles. But uh, at a certain moment, this median will go up. This is because more 
uh, then one particle is simultaneously eliminated and detected. Uh, and that's an indication of swarm detection. So uh, a serial dilution control is a check for swarm. Uh, that's not the only uh, that's not the only acid control. Uh, there are many acid controls written down in the micro cycling uh, which confirm that uh, the reagents stay uh, vesicles and not uh, that you're measuring, for example, uh, let's say yeah, aggregates of antibodies uh, or other particles than EBs. Uh, so hence this arrow from sample staining to all these controls. Uh, and I'm just going to mention two as an example and, and the rest you could look up in the manuscript if you're interested. So one uh, very important control, which I, I think you should always start an experiment with is the buffer only control. Uh, this is the control where you measure only your buffer. Uh, it's important because you're diluting your vesicles in this buffer, so it needs to be clean. And it also shows you whether uh, the flow set order itself is clean and whether the settings of the flow set order are fine. I mean, if they uh, are not fine and perhaps uh, you trigger on the noise, you can see only noise and you think you're not part. So uh, just measuring buffer in itself is already important to, uh, to do regularly. Um, we do that uh, generally a few uh, times per day. Um, and then the buffer with reagents control is nothing more than uh, adding the reagents under exactly the same conditions as you would add them to the vesicles, to the buffer. Uh, and then measure uh, these reagents uh, uh, also with the same settings uh, on the flow set. And here you can see that uh, these data, which I got from Vera, and she got it from uh, Jonathan Burney and Christian Russo. Um, uh, so uh, has so these at uh, these concentrations the IDGPE uh, label which was used here uh, yielded positive counts and it's of course not something that you want. So uh, this concentration was uh, simply too high for, for use, uh, and uh, after about 250 fold dilution, you see that uh, these positive false positive counts uh, drop to perhaps reasonable level, but that's of course user. Uh, User dependent, what your criteria are. Uh, so, a very important control. Another control, and that's the last I would like to mention here, is the detergent treatment control. So, here we have uh, stained vesicles with uh, anti tetraspanin and PE. Um, this is the same sample after the addition of 0.1% triton. Uh, and as an extra check, uh, the triton only, you can see that most of these particles disappear. Uh, which is an indication that those particles were indeed vesicles. So that brings me to uh, the end of uh, my part of the presentation. So I will give the word to Joshua, who will talk about calibration. Great, so uh, today I'm going to talk to you in the, in the kind of theme of this, uh, this journal club that uh, Ken started. I'm going to talk to you today about a paper that I uh, co-authored with Vera Tang. Um, this paper actually came around because Vera and I were giving quite a number of workshops on uh, calibration and what we realized were um, there were no really good examples uh, in the literature of calibration. But more importantly, there weren't um, kind of FCS files that people could go and download and use uh, to try calibration for themselves for the first time if they if they didn't have all the reagents at once or if they just wanted to try it out before um, attempting to do it. So this manuscript uh, demonstrates the utility of calibration, but it's also uh, all of the FCS files are, are publicly available and you can download them and use them and replicate the data if you want to. Uh, so as I said, the, the, the main aim of this paper was actually just to generate some publicly available data that we could use for our workshops and tutorials, but also allow others to use. Uh, the secondary kind of aim uh, and the point of why we were doing these workshops was to demonstrate the utility of currently available reagents and software. And I really have to emphasize that these are everything that we've used here, uh, you could go out and buy. Uh, so this isn't something special in our lab or something you know we have access to that you don't. This is all available information. Um, this just so happened to be the first demonstration of simultaneous fluorescence light scatter and flow rate calibration uh, compared across instruments at different and different settings. 
Uh, and we also showed small particle epitope density for the first time, which I think will be of real utility to, to the field in future for standardization efforts. So we, we chose to use a murine leukemia virus as a reference material for validating calibration. And the reason we chose to do that instead of using an, an EV population is firstly, because there aren't many uh, EV reference materials available. Uh, and when we're trying to validate calibration, it's usually much more convincing to have a population that is either fully resolvable or not. And you can instinctively know whether it's being detected or not. With EVs, this is obviously very difficult because we're not detecting all of our EVs regardless of the platform that we're using. Uh, so it's definitely something we need to do as a standardization effort in the field, but uh, as a proof of concept, it was uh, less convincing to do. So this is a commercially available uh, virus. It's biological, it has um, EMV, so it's got glycoproteins on its surface and they're labeled with a superfolder GFP. Um, and the reason that we, we like this is that we can actually come in with an anti-GFP antibody um, and that's P labeled and that's how we're calibrating. So the, the superfolder GFP you're seeing on this virus that I'm showing you isn't actually fluorescent, it's been inactivated. Uh, and this population is small and homogeneous, it's 120 nanometers roughly, uh, li limited epitope abundance and it's, it's stable, it's a commercial product. And the software um, is very much um, how I got into flow cytometry in the first place. Uh, originally, my thesis was based around light scatter calibration. Eventually, uh, in 2017, uh, this became publicly available and I integrated fluorescent calibration and FCS file integration so that you could write all of these calibration parameters to your FCS files. This was actually where the, uh, this manuscript was published and used this version two of the software. Uh, this uh, reporting is actually far easier now that version three is available. So all of the calibration in version three is automated and written to the MyFlowSite EV template for you. Uh, and it also outputs all of your QC plots. So in theory, you just have to fill out the information about your samples uh, and attach the these to your supplementary information. Uh, and we've got some big updates coming out in uh, this year where we have automated as much as we can. Uh, and we're also trying to integrate into um, existing platforms like EVTrack and, and XRNA Atlas. So if you're really interested in uh, seeing different calibration tools and exactly how to use them, uh, I have a, uh, we have a, a Cyto workshop that's on YouTube. Uh, I actually showed, it's an eight minute presentation I gave in this, which showed uh, how to calibrate this exact data set from start to finish. Uh, John Nolan and Edwin Vanderpol also demonstrate uh, different calibration methods. So I, I really um, recommend looking at that if you're interested in, in utilizing these. So we've mentioned calibration a lot um, and we haven't necessarily defined it yet. So calibration is the conversion of arbitrary units to standard units. The goal of calibration is that we are all working using the same ruler. And if we're using the same ruler, it means we can make comparisons regardless of how we're measuring, what we're measuring. So this is uh, the example from the paper where we've taken this virus population at three different uh, fluorescent detector settings. And the black uh, instrument is instrument one and the blue instrument is instrument two. And you can see that none of these populations overlap. Despite being fully detected, they're not on the scale at the same place. So this is inherently where we have issues when we're trying to make comparisons um, across platforms, regardless of whether something's fully resolved or not. And the idea of calibration is we take all of this arbitrary unit data, and now that we're working on a common scale, you can see that all of the data overlaps. So the premise is regardless of how sensitive your instrument is, what settings you use, you can still have data that's comparable. So this is very important, not only for acquiring data to be uh, standardized, but it also means that our, our data is always going to be valid. Even when a new instrument comes out that's more sensitive, we'll still be able to overlay our data and check that it, it fits with uh, the updated information that we have to available to us. So fluorescence calibration is very simple. It's um, you get a set of beads and each of these beads have a quantified number of fluorophores. Uh, so in this case, we have PEMESF beads, so molecules of equivalent soluble fluorophore. Uh, and this lowest bead has around 474 molecules on it. Uh, and this one's in the thousands. And we draw this linear regression and it means that we can convert our arbitrary units to standard units. So this is very simple and it's been around for over two decades now. It's, it's very established. Light scatter calibration is much more complex. So um, 
Edwin van der Poel has the crown for um, showing the utility of uh, light scatter calibration, particularly uh, in the EV field um, using knee theory. So this is just, um, if you imagine that you're looking the top down over an EV uh, or, or small particles as they're being illuminated uh, from the bottom up uh, in a flow cytometer, this is how the light scatters around it. The way or, or the number of these resonances that are being collected and therefore the ratio between all of these particles changes. And this is why light scatter calibration is difficult and it results in one of these me curves. So this me curve, uh, this scatter diameter curve is specific for every flow cytometer because it's collection angle dependent. When you change the collection angle, the, um, the distance between this polystyrene and the silica and then the green, the EVs, the ratios between these will change. And the way to interpret it, this is, is that if something has a, an arbitrary scatter intensity here, so this is an 80 nanometer bead at just below 10 to the 4, uh, how many, uh, what size is it? So this 80 nanometer polystyrene V is a, approximately equivalent to around 120 nanometer vesicle. In the case of our, um, our murine leukemia virus, which is slightly higher in refractive index, our right 80 nanometer bead is around the same size as the 120 nanometer virus. And taking into account these differences in refractive indices is really important, but it's, it's very achievable. And it's, it's something you can do today with free software and commercially available standards that are NIST traceable. And then the, the final thing that we were, we were calibrating and really the thing that everyone likes to report uh, in the EV field is concentration. And the problem that we have in the EV field is that we all report absolute concentration, but do we ever really measure total EV concentration? And the answer really is no. So our concentration really should be defined as the number of particles that exceed our limit of detection. And only when we start doing this will we start having a literature that's standardized and we can start making true comparisons. And you'll often see in, in manuscripts that do uh, a nanoparticle tracking analysis um, and they get their concentration from that and you see their diameter distribution and the diameter distribution might stop at about 150 nanometers. You then go over to their EM data and you see that the majority of vesicles are below 100 nanometers. And this just means that our techniques, when we start comparing them, all have different limits of detection. And until we start reporting a limit of detection, we're not going to have comparable concentration units. So we put this into practice in our, our paper as a proof of principle. You can see that if I draw a gate around my virus population in our Cytoflex uh, instrument, if I leave my data in arbitrary units, it's not there in my, in my LSR Fortessa instrument acquisition. But when I calibrate both of these data sets, if I calibrate light scatter to a diameter, and if I calibrate the fluorescence to molecules of PE, you can see that now if I draw one gate uh, on either of the flow cytometers, it's um, representative of where it needs to be on the, the other flow cytometer. Despite having different limits of detection, you can see here that the LSR for Tesla is cutting off part of this population uh, and different settings. So this all feeds back into the, the concentration that I mentioned. So straight away, we could use this black gate where we don't account for the limit of detection and we just gate around our virus. And you can see that we detect more uh, virus on our, uh, our cytoflex because we could detect the full population uh, compared to our LSR Fortessa and that, that makes total sense. But if we wanted to validate that actually the LSR Fortessa's data was, was true, uh, we could change our limit of detection now on the the cytoflex so that it had the same limit of detection on scatter, uh, in this case, the diameter, uh, and constrain the gates. And you can see that when we constrain the gates to have the same limits of detection, our concentration measurements are much closer to the other. Uh, and this is the idea is that we, we need to start doing this uh, in the EV field if we really want to uh, start making uh, translational studies useful, and more importantly, whether we can validate uh, translational studies that are done. So this is probably a, a little bit more of the boring part, but maybe something that uh, those of you who are interested in utilizing this framework uh, would like to see. Uh, so the framework is, is split into sections, as Edwin said, to allow others to repeat your assay broadly, to provide evidence that you're looking at single EVs. This section allows others to validate your data and then just transparency on how you've interpreted your data and how you've reported it. So for our pre-analytical variables, um, we stated how the virus was made and where it was derived from and provided a reference for that. 
The purpose keywords and experiment variables, these come from my flow site. And the real purpose of these is that in future, these will be integrated into uh, databases and repositories where you'll be submitting your data uh, so that people can download it and validate it and, and inspect the, the quality. Uh, the purpose obviously allows people to look at the aim. The keywords allow people to search through this database. Uh, and then the parameters will tell them uh, what your experiment uh, included. So it's a way of indexing your experiment. Uh, the sample preparation steps, uh, these are a replication of the methods, but it, by including them in this framework, it means that you don't have to trawl through someone's methods to find out what they did. You can go to one document. Uh, and we mentioned uh, how the, the viruses were stained at one concentration and for how long. Uh, again, uh, with uh, sample dilution or washing steps, if we didn't uh, perform any washing steps in this case, we tightened the antibody, so they weren't included, it wasn't applicable. Uh, the sample dilution, we stated that, uh, you know, our vial of commercially available virus, how much we diluted it for uh, staining and analyzing it. And then for our controls, uh, we had a buffer only control. We, we stated what we had and what we didn't have. Uh, in the case of isotypes, we didn't use an isotype control here because we actually had another version of the virus uh, where there was no GFP to actually bind to the anti-GFP antibody. So we thought this was a better control. And similarly, the other control that we didn't include in this case was uh, detergent tre treatment. Uh, this was a virus population, so they, they tend to be less labile. Uh, and uh, we're not trying to prove that we're, we're detecting EVs as opposed to antibody aggregates, as we've got a nice homogeneous population that we can clearly resolve. And this is the same case for serial dilution, because we can quantitate our virus independently on other, on other instruments, and it's, it's basically treated like a bead. If you were doing EV samples, you definitely would need to do serial dilutions and uh, possibly detergent treatments. Again, with the trigger channels and thresholds, we stated what the arbitrary units were. We also stated what the calibrated uh, trigger channel is. And this is important because this determines what our limit of detection for the instrument is in calibrated units. This is something that can be relatable to people regardless of the instrument they use. The flow rate, um, we said we used the Cytoflex internal flow rate uh, for the LSR Fortessa, we used spiking beads. License calibration, we mentioned the beads we used and the linear regressions. And we stated here that we, we uh, cross calibrated some AP beads. So these two sections are actually fully automated in the FCM PAR software and they will actually refer to the QC output plots that you ge uh, generated. They also refer to tables um, that contain all of the catalog numbers, the reference numbers that you use for your regression. So as I said at the start, this is actually far easier to use now uh, in the updated software because you won't need to touch them. It will all be done uh, automatically for you. Uh, for the EV diameter, we, we stated what the, um, what the range of diameters we were. We detected the refractive index. We assumed to infer the diameter um, and then the number of uh, epitopes that we, we were detecting for the PE molecules. And we obviously put the assumptions in here that this is assuming that there wasn't steric hindrance uh, and there was one antibody per GFP molecule. So these are reasonable assumptions, but um, it's important that people interpret this correctly. Uh, and finally, as uh, with regard to reporting, is, is just mentioning the, the MyFlow site. Again, this will be automated in the, the upcoming uh, version 4 software. The detection range is very important. So the dynamic range states the window with which you can detect particles. So the upper and, and lower limit of detection. So in most cases, the lower limit of detection is going to be most important for reporting EVs. In some cases, with the instruments like the Nano FCM, which are very sensitive, they actually have an upper limit of detection. So you've actually got a narrow window of which particles you can detect. So it's important that you say what that window is, so that when we come to standardizing uh, the data, people can make comparisons um, when they have different dynamic ranges. Uh, we've stated uh, the detection concentrations and how they range it between uh, all of the, the acquisitions we, uh, we acquired. Uh, and again, the, the EV number and concentration have been mentioned in section 4.3 and 4.4. And then the final thing is providing uh, the data to a public repository. And this for me is one of the most important things that you can do when you're submitting uh, a manuscript using uh, EV flow cytometry. Being able to look at a population can instantly uh, 
for, for people that are experienced, you'll know by looking at plots whether something has been acquired is truly EVs or whether they're swarm detecting. Um, a picture is definitely worth a thousand words. So I would highly recommend um, making your data publicly available. Uh, so to wrap up, uh, the, the, there's so much uh, kind of boring stuff about calibration, about standardization. It's incredibly important, but the, the other important thing is there's so many people's questions when they're starting out, they can all be answered with calibration. So which instrument should you use? Which detector settings should you use? You know, can my results be normalized for day-to-day -day variation? Can I do a longitudinal study? You know, can my results be validated? All of these questions can be answered by calibrating your data. Um, and, you know, when you, when you want to optimize your assay, it's so useful to quantify it. So this is from a manuscript that we're in the process of finishing up where we use the default instrument settings and we have a limit of detection of 600 molecules of FITC. When we've finished optimizing our instrument uh, and the detector settings, we've improved that four times. And I have a number now that I can quantitate and I can say that not only am I detecting more EVs in the concentration, I can actually tie a number to why I'm detecting more EVs in the concentration. Uh, so this is incredibly important. The other thing I'll say is, is unless this is used, so many of the manuscripts being published where membrane dyes are being compared are just not useful for other people with different instruments because all of our detection parameters have different sensitivities and what might be the most sensitive thing for you will not be for another person. So unless you calibrate your data, your, your results will not be applicable to someone else and the dye that you find to be best may not be the best for someone else. So the only way to do this in an impartial, you know, unbiased way is to start reporting these types of studies uh, in calibrated units. And the final thing I want to say about calibration is standardization is incredibly important. But one of the most important things that we're, we're all interested in is characterizing the particles you know, that we're, we're studying. Um, and you can get so much more information when you can start quantifying the diameter or the abundance of an epitope, the density of an epitope, or maybe the refractive index of the particles. We're going to start quantifying and understanding our populations in a, in a very different way that's going to be beneficial for moving the field forward. Uh, so not only is, are you going to gain standardization, you're actually going to understand what you're analyzing far better. And then the, the last thing I want to leave you on is um, the EV flow cytometry working group obviously worked very hard. We, I think we, we argued for about five years before we, we published this framework. Uh, and it's great that uh, that's out. A byproduct of that is that we've been working for the last three years on an educational compendium. So this is huge. I think this is actually at, uh, over 40,000 words now. Um, and it's meant to be a very detailed um, manuscript where anyone from any background can come and learn what they need to to pick up EV flow cytometry. And we're, we're in the final stages of uh, writing this manuscript before submission, hopefully by the end of the summer. Uh, so definitely keep your eyes peeled for that. So we obviously have to thank the, the EV flow cytometry working group. A lot of the work was initiated by then, and, and I definitely need to give a shout out to Vera Tang because most of the, the samples that you saw acquired here were from, from her instruments, and uh, she's definitely been extremely helpful in, in developing most of these, uh, these educational tools in this manuscript. Excellent. Well, Josh and Edwin, thank you so much for sharing with us today. Um, Vera, thank you for attending. I saw that you're out there too. Um, so feel free to also chime in when in the in the question and answer because some of these questions might also um, be directed towards you. Um, I wanted to start though um, with a question about how to use the Mo the, the MyFlowSite EV framework uh, for some of the newer instruments that are coming out. Are there instruments that are coming out that are are uh, you know have special characteristics? Um, I'm thinking about some of the um, some of the platforms where you can't even do flow cytometry with them anymore because they have a channel that's so small. So something like uh, you know the the flow nano analyzer from Nano SCM um, or some of the homemade things that, that that people are are making to you know reduce that background by um, by by limiting the size of things that can go through. So so what what special you know considerations do we have for our reporting requirements for for instruments like that? Uh, there aren't any, to be honest. I mean, although those instruments are very sensitive, they're still limited by their sensitivity. Um, so I don't think there are any exceptions where calibration is not needed. 
um, it's certainly harder um, and it's certainly an ergonomic hurdle. And that's something that needs to be considered when doing your assays. There are beads available. Uh, they, they have built in uh, light gas calibration, for example, to two diameters. The fluorescence calibration is obviously a lot more tricky. Uh, there are companies like Solarcus available now that are starting to sell smaller beads with antibody capture instead of MESF beads. Um, there are definitely ways around it, uh, but I, I certainly wouldn't say that any instrument platform was exempt from uh, the requirements of uh, demonstrating their sensitivity limits. And I would say it's actually more important um, if you not only have a lower limit of detection, but an upper limit of detection to quantify that. Yeah, I was actually thinking about are there additional things that would need to be, um, you know, to, to, to be reported with, um, you know, those high sensitivity platforms? Uh, I don't, I don't think so off the top okay. of my head. So it's, uh, so, so we have, uh, you know, we, we've got to follow the rules no matter what. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> um, let's go to the, to the, um, to the chat box then. And I have enabled, I have enabled people to um, unmute their microphones. So Edwin and Josh, I, I'll, I'll basically hand this over to you because you can see the chat box too, and you can kind of pick these questions as you want. Um, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, we don't have to limit ourselves to the hour. Um, so if, if you're okay with answering some questions for a bit, that's fine with me. So, um, so I'll, I'll leave it up to you now. All right. Um, I was already thinking about the first question, how many antibodies to stay? in the same UV population is recommended to not reach the point of steric hindrance, please. The other one, of course, uh, this depends on the size of the antibody, on uh, the number of antigens per surface area that you want to stain. Uh, it depends on the mobility of the membrane. Uh, a phospholipid membrane without proteins is, is a two-dimensional fluid that uh, certain proteins could to, to make this more stiff. Um, and enabling itself is a continuous process, it, it, it's a, which reaches a dynamic equilibrium. So uh, uh, antibodies attach to antigens and they get loose. So, and, and then uh, regarding the steric hindrance, in order to, to confirm that, you have to be able to differentiate that from quenching and, and perhaps separating uh, uh, your laboring process. And with a, just a normal flow shift, I think it's very difficult to do that. Uh, meaning you need specific equipment uh, to, to, to confirm uh, that uh, st it's steric hindrance which uh, limits your uh, your labeling procedure. Th that that's my answer. Nada, did you want to step in and and uh, follow up on that? Feel free to if that's the case. It might be useful for Nada to speak up. It seems like. Uh, they have lots of questions. Yeah, there, there are a couple. I'm sorry. No, we love questions. We love questions. Keep, keep them coming. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, go ahead. Go ahead and ask your um, these other questions that you have. Feel free. Sure, thank you. So the other one was about the phosphorylated proteins. I've tried looking, you know, on in the literature, but I, I'm not sure I, I found any publication that was looking at phosphorylated proteins on EVs by flow cytometry. So can anyone? So phosphoflow is, is used in cell uh, flow cytometry. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's very hard um, and its uh, sensitivity is definitely a limit. Um, I, I would be very you would need very specialized equipment and a lot of time dedicated to an assay to, to expect to see uh, phosphorylation on EV proteins. It's, it's a very tricky thing to try and do um, on most commercial platforms. I, I don't think you would be able to achieve it. Uh, with the, regards to the how many antibodies to stay to not reach a point of steric hindrance. Uh, yeah, I agree with, uh, with Edwin. It's, it's a, such a subjective thing and it really depends on what you're staining. If it's an overexpressed protein um, and, and, and you stain with it first, you might uh, block other proteins. I've definitely seen super resolution microscopy studies where they stained with just CD963 and 81 and they do them in different orders and they get different results uh, depending on the order they, they stain with. 
um, within in terms of intensity. Usually, the, the thing that finds to incubate first is the brightest because you've you've uh, it wasn't sterically hindered. But um, it's it's something you 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 have to try and, and find out for yourself. Um, in terms of your isotype control, it's it's an interesting thing. So you have more uh, signal from your isotype control than you do from your your stain sample by the sound of it. Uh, one of the things that you should probably start up front is doing a serial dilution of that sample to confirm that you're not swarm detecting, as, as Edwin showed, the, the actual antibody. Sometimes, although they, it might be a matched antibody, concentrations of antibodies are not super precisely quantified. Um, and, you know, a little bit of a change in concentration can result in, a, in swarm detection. Um, so I, I would recommend doing a serial dilution just to check that it's, it's not an antibody concentration thing. Uh, Losing EVs triggered to fluorescence. Um, so there's a misconception that fluorescence is always the best trigger. Um, it is not. Um, it really depends on your assay. It depends on your flow cytometer and the alignment. Um, if you are losing particles when you use a fluorescence trigger as opposed to a scatter trigger, it's most likely that your dye probably isn't bright enough and they're actually merging with the background before uh, the scatter trigger. And then when you switch to a fluorescent trigger, you're you're even more limited. The other thing that happens is that when you use a scatter trigger, your noise on your fluorescence channels is fairly low, but when you switch to a fluorescent trigger, your, your noise raises, so you have to raise your threshold above where your background would be for that fluorescent channel if you just use a scatter trigger. So you have to bear these things in mind and there's no, there is no gold standard, there's no gold standard assay where this is best and this will work best on all instruments. It is something, unfortunately, you have to find out for yourself and. One of the things that we're trying to do is in promoting the standardization is also to point out the heterogeneity in uh, instrument sensitivity within the field. I've seen a huge amount of variation in sensitivity on the same platform where they literally could not, on one instrument, the same identical instruments, one couldn't detect uh, a 200 nanometer bead and another one's detecting 70 nanometer beads. Um, and this is all down to alignment and uh, these manufacturers are catering to cell users. Most of the engineers aren't yet um, experts in uh, aligning for small particles. Uh, so that's something that maybe a flow core manager can help you with. Uh, and one of the things that we're also writing a manuscript about is to try and quantify your instrument and track it over time. So Josh, I just want to interrupt. I think that's a very important point because you know you you hear about people who get a you know, an instrument coming in for a demo, they're not able to do what they want to do. There might be a very good reason for that and one that is easily addressed, you know, if you have the right, um, the right expertise to do it. So uh, just just keep that in mind, just because you can't, can't throw something on the instrument and get a good measurement right away doesn't mean that it can't be done. Absolutely. Um, is it a good idea to use lipid dyes? Uh, they've definitely shown to have some utility. Um, they're difficult in certain circumstances, they can create their own measles, so their own fluorescent populations. This is where a reagent and buffer control is very important. Um, this is also sometimes where this procedural control will come in. So let's say that you, you need to use um, density gradients to remove unbound dye. You'd want to show that you haven't actually introduced an artifact uh, into your, your ED population. So you'd, you'd put everything through that same protocol that you remove the dye with, except your EVs, and run that as a control. Um, lipid dyes are also really difficult to just work with. So membrane intercalating dyes need a certain amount of something like DMSO to help them intercalate. If you integrate too much DMSO, the light scatter population actually goes down. It changes the refractive index negatively. If you use too much, you'll lyse your vesicles. If you don't use enough, you'll have loads of background and loads of uh, mesal formations. <laughs> um, and then you've got the titration of the dye itself to the EV. So really you should know a lipid to dye ratio and, and you would know the number of EVs before you stain them with your dye. So in cell culture, this is, this is usually achievable and something you can pull off. When you work with an unknown sample like plasma or serum, where it's really hard to quantify the, the total number of EVs, it's, it's much harder to, to titrate your, your dye to it. Um, there are definitely people working to, to make it possible. Um, Lactaterin is a slightly different case where it's a, it's a protein that's binding to the, the phosphatidylserine. I, I imagine you definitely could get steric problems if there was enough of it um, found, but again, it's going to be super dependent on whether all of your EVs are even PS positive. 
um, and whether they will interfere with the protein that your antibody is, is binding to. So uh, Nada, because I, I just flew through all your questions, do you want to <laughs> just say? If, Bless uh, you, thank you so much. That was very helpful. Uh, actually, my question about the lactadherin and the lipidase, it's because I was uh, wondering, I mean, is it best to use, I was using an XM5 starting with, and really the calcium is on, on plasma samples. So it's, you know, causing this coagulation and it's not working really well. So I was thinking either switching to lactadherin or like an epithelial marker, like an EPCAM or something, because I'm looking at epithelial uh, cell derived cancers. So I'm not sure what's the best thing to do really. I, I do not have the answer for you. Um, it's it's going to be super subjective. So even with lactadherin, uh, the only commercial available form is in FITSI uh, that I know of. Um, and that will obviously depend, its utility to you will depend on how sensitive your FITSI channel is compared to maybe a PE or a, an APC channel. Um, so this this is the thing, is these assays are, are super specific to what you want to do. do. I mean, are you even interested in whether it's it's membrane positive or not, or uh, whether are you really interested in actually the proteins that are positive on the surface of the EZVs? And then it's a case of, well, if it's if you're not that interested, is it just a case of identifying EVs from non-EVs? Could you do that with maybe a detergent control? Um, are, are you gaining sensitivity by doing it? By the sounds of being limited, when you, when you lose EVs, switching to a fluorescent trigger, you're not gaining every, anything by sensitivity in some of these cases. And then the point is, is I'm trying to get at is, is is it necessary for the assay? Um, so th these are very subjective questions that will be um, specific to you and everyone else that has their own assays and their own research questions. And um, it's something where you need to first start with quantifying your instrument, checking what the most sensitive channel is, the most sensitive channel you'll want to use for your, your proteins and your antibodies, because that's the thing that you're really interested in. And maybe the second or third most sensitive channel you'll want to use for your bulk label, because there'll be much more of it um, and it will pull out your EVs. Uh, and then that channel is going to dictate, you know, what, what you want to use, right? Um, so you, you probably want to start with your instrument first, because that's what you have to work with, and then design your assay around it. Thank you. I think that was all my questions. Thank you very much. So one last thing, following up on the isotype controls. So I, I don't know, I was first um, gating on the isotype control, using the isotype control, of course, with the other controls, but when it comes up really similar to the my EV sample, I don't know what to do. And that's something I think uh, we, you'd need to see the, the plot of to kind of um, understand what's happening. But so if, it's similar, you, you mean the counts are similar, the concentration or exactly, positive particles? Yes. The, the positive particles. So did you do a buffer only control and reagents in buffer control? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm. Okay, so that, that they were negative, right? Yes. And you've ruled out non-specific binding. Yeah, it could be if FC receptor binding or non-specific binding. That's maybe one thing uh, to figure out, uh, which may help. Uh, yeah, FC I was wondering lipoprotein. Uh, could also be, but you, you can block uh, the FC receptor uh, uh, probably with the uh, IgG uh, without the fluorescent label. If you want to troubleshoot some more, it, it might be, uh, I'm sure Edwin and I would be happy to, to answer emails just so we can answer some other questions. Um, Absolutely, thank you so much. So it's, it's difficult. But, uh, yeah. Is that a monoclonal or a polyclonal isotype? Because like if it's polyclonal, yeah, I mean, maybe just try a different one because I mean, isotypes aren't necessarily going to be your identical antibody, right? It is an isotype. Uh, Maria Garcia, uh, are you still around? Hi, I'm here. I was wondering uh, if you have any alternative particles that you could use for your calibration. Uh, I was just checking the Viraflow website and it says that they're all sold out. So I don't know if you've, how recent this is, but if there's an alternative that you recommend. Yeah, or somebody wants to boycott Canada, right? <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> 
Um, so we we uh, we use the viral flow particles for validation rather than calibration, and that's a, a hair split, but a, an important one. But um, reference materials that you can use to develop assays and things. Um, the viral flow ones were very nice um, for for testing things out. For for EVs, um, there's um, a new reagent. So Anne Hendricks uh, group uh, have a Nature Communications paper um, with recombinant EVs. Uh, that's just turned into a commercial product being sold by Sigma. I think if you Google um, fluorescence exosome reference material or something like that, exosome was a poor, poor name, and uh, I believe it was the marketing and not Anne. <laughs> but um, those, those we've tested are very nice. Uh, they're GFP positive, so they, they'll help you because uh, um, you know, you'll know whether you've detected them or not. Uh, they'll, they might have some limitations if you want to test something that's in the green channel. Um, so ATCC, I believe, are, are also starting to sell EVs now. Um, we've tested some of those, and, and uh, they, they've been reasonably good. Um, and I believe also Solarcus sell um, EVs as well that we've, we've tested, platelet, red blood cell uh, EVs. So they, they, those are blood products that are, I think are just stimulated, and uh, they definitely work for if you want to test a membrane dye or antibody staining. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a few around now when they're growing. Um, Thank you. And then Joanne, do you want to uh, ask Joanne a question? Hi, Joanne. Why don't you uh, ask your question about the repository? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the thing I often hear from people that um, most puts them off about uh, uploading their data is, is the difficulty. Um, and the sites that do have the ability to upload them, they're very hard to query. They're loaded with like, especially the flow cytometry repos uh, repository. There's, there's not that many data files in there for EVs and you've got to weed through all these other data files. So I think, you know, as a field, we should start thinking about um, somehow either with, um, you know, um, uh, the ISEV and ISAC and, and maybe the NIH or whoever to developing a repository just for EV work for the, in the future. So there is um, an EV repository um, under development as part of an ERCC project. Um, how long that will take to be publicly available, I, I'm not sure, but I think within the next couple of years. I also believe flow repository, um, which is the only you know, real alternative, is, is getting a refresh uh, in the next year or so. Um, but I agree, uh, a we... dedicated one would be much better. <laughs> right. Maybe we can convince the, the, um, the flow repository one to, have, to break them up into sections um, for easier use. So have dedicated areas of the repository for, for different reasons, different purposes. Yeah, so the, the, the ERCC one that we, I mentioned is, is one of the things that we've, I've been trying to tie the FCM file software into so that as well as automating the microsite EV output and having everything ready for publication, it actually also will be a, a template for uploading your data into a repository as well. Uh, so that your, your files can all be indexed and you, you won't have to do too much field filling in like you do in my the flow repository at the moment. Great, thanks. Virginia. Yeah, this is, I, I think you've already answered my question. I was asking about the MLV and whether there are any restrictions, but I think also, you address that there are alternative sources of um, EV surrogates, which I think we would really love to explore. And thank you for your great talks. Yeah, Vera, you're here. Do you want to just comment quickly on the um, MLV inactivation and special handling issues since they're... Yeah, the MLVs are inactivated with paraformaldehyde. So they are not infectious anymore, and uh, they are tested for infectivity, at least, you know, sample tested usually. I mean, when I knew about them. Um, but yeah, I think Josh's suggestions may probably be better um, 
reagents and reference particles to use for what it sounds like everybody here wants to test out for. Um, we chose the MLBs because A, I have ready access to them, and B, they're just really nice type populations to do instrument comparisons with. But for assay development that are specific for EVs, I think the ones that he suggested, which are legit EVs, may be better uh, types of samples for you to use. Thank you. So Dirk has a very subjective question. Yeah, the, Dirk Jan asks um, what uh, the lower size and concentration ranges are that you can measure with uh, a flow cytometer. Um, yeah, the, I agree with Josh, that's a bit subjective. Um, I mean, roughly you, you can divide uh, some categories of flow cytometers out there in the field, I would say. Uh, there are the flow cytometers which you find in hospitals uh, or, or clinical labs. Uh, often they are used daily and, and uh, a lot of things are going through the flow cell there. So it's not necessarily clean. Uh, so at best, I would say uh, with such instrument, um, yeah, the detection limit is sub micrometer, uh, but limited uh, by at least a few hundred nanometers. Uh, uh, it, it could be much worse though. Um, so then there are flow cytometers, which uh, were originally designed as clinical flow cytometers, uh, but which you can now buy as uh, being dedicated to sub-micrometer particle analysis. Uh, they go down to, to typically 100 to 200 nanometer uh, vesicle detection uh, for the scatter detector. Uh, for fluorescence, it's hard to say because it depends entirely on the label that you use uh, and, and also on the alignment of, of the flow cytometer. Um, and then there is uh, there are uh, specialty machines which are not really uh, flow cytometers uh, anymore. I, I would say from the perspective that cyto means cell, uh, and and I would not uh, use such an instrument to measure cell cells. Um, an example is the nano flow cytometer. Uh, it goes to sub hundred nanometers. Uh, I think with with uh, optimal alignment, it could detect about the smallest vesicles present. But I'm not sure whether you reach that always uh, with a commercial instrument uh, in the lab. Uh, but potentially, this is possible. Uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> regarding the concentration, yeah, you have seen the plot uh, concentration versus size. Uh, so, so that's a tricky question because, uh, yeah, the concentration of particles uh, which are sub micron depend on the size range where you are measuring. Um, so, so uh, the sensitivity of your flow cytometer uh, also determines uh, most likely what the lower concentration is that you would depend or can detect. And for us, this depends also on the, the background count. So how uh, clean is your machine? Um, on the assay, uh, did you dilute your sample or not? Because every time you dilute, uh, yeah, you affect the concentration of your particles. Uh, and and um, it also depends on how long you measure in practice with the assay that we use in the lab and our flow cytometer, this is an apogee, uh, uh, we can go down to uh, about uh, 10 to the fourth, so, so about 10,000 particles per unit. But that's the very low limit uh, concentration wise. But for other assays, uh, even in our own lab, we could set it up differently. So it, um, many variables involved. Yeah, I, th I think the time Thing you mentioned is an important one. If, if a lot of people are interested in cancer biomarkers um, and when you isolate EVs from plasma or serum, you're getting all of the red blood cell EVs, all of the platelet EVs, and you're, you're going through all of them one by one. And if you, if you don't analyze for long enough, you won't see the needle in the haystack. And it, it's a really important consideration that you should bear in mind when you're doing a translational study like that, how, how abundant is the thing you're actually looking for? Because it will completely dictate your assay can be, um, I can be totally honest about our essay. And I did this calculation yesterday evening. Um, so, so we measure directly in diluted plasma. Uh, so uh, we make plasma, we prepare plasma basically because we want to freeze, right? Uh, but if we would not like to freeze, we could basically with the flow cytometer measure measuring whole lot. Uh, but, but we measure in plasma and uh, we freeze 100 microliter uh, uh, aliquot, of which we measure only 
uh, a fraction of one in 16,000. So we measure typically about five nanometers of this plasma. And that's just because there are so many chiral microns out there. And, and this is one of my concerns. Uh, so for, for example, for uh, measuring the concentration of uh, vesicles with erythrocyte markers or platelet markers, this is fine. Uh, in, in our uh, two minute essay, we count uh, several thousands, uh, but uh, I think for many other uh, vesicle types, uh, yeah, it, this, is, uh, this volume is too low. So the chylomicrons and field, they are hampering our essay. So there may need a, there may need to be a concentration, uh, some some kind of specific concentration or isolation step first. Uh, yeah. But then, of course, you have the 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 issue of getting the things off of your beads or off of your antibodies that you were using. So, um, yeah, definitely, and, definitely and, a stack is appropriate. Yeah, and and clinically compatible, preferably. Yeah. All right, do we have any more questions? Um, I see we, we have a lot of nice links that people have put in the chat box. Um, I'll do my best to make sure that these are also in the uh, description on the YouTube channel when we get the archive up. Um, oh, here, uh, one from Lilia uh, who asks, are, are data produced with flow cytometry without following my flow CIDV or without reporting, are they completely lost to the field? So should we just discard all of those studies um, or, is, or is there a possibility of redeeming them? Uh, clinical studies, I, I would, it, it's very difficult. I think assay, we've learned a lot from the literature to get where we are. Um, they've not been lost to the field. The, the reason we've got to where we are is because of the publications to date. The utility of clinical studies um, that haven't been calibrated, are the samples are gone now. Um, we might have a hypothesis we can raise from them, but in terms of using actual numbers from them, it'll be very difficult uh, to integrate them into any kind of future, uh, you know, power calculation or, or you know, study. Um, and uh, I, again, with the with the assay, people focusing on assay development, it's uh, you can always go to a publication and replicate people's data um, and and see if the assay works for you. The, the limiting factor with the published assay data is that if it doesn't work for you, you don't know if it's because you haven't done it properly or just because your instrument is a different type of instrument um, or, or you know, other factors that play in. So no, no, no publication is lost. It's just that if you want to create a publication that will definitely have longevity and stay relevant, um, using the MyFlows IEV framework is the way to do it. Good. All right. Well, I think we need to, to stop the, um, the session here. So thank you all for staying on an extra 20 minutes. Um, I think it's good to have these discussions. Um, and as Edwin and Josh said, feel free to reach out to Edwin and Josh for any additional questions that you might have or to participate in the community, uh, the community efforts that are ongoing around flow cytometry for EVs. Um, and I just want to, um, to end, I did notice that there was a question about Jev. Um, does Jeb require my flow side EV? And, and I, I would defer that question to the, you know, the editor in chief, the deputy editors, but I would say that each of us has a responsibility to try to use this framework in our own work and in our, in our own reporting. Um, and also as reviewers, you know, I mean, whether a journal requires something or not, we as reviewers can always um, remind the, you know, the submitting authors that this, this resource is available, this framework is available and encourage, um, encourage its use. And I think we're going to see uh, more and more adoption um, of the framework as time goes by. I think anytime you have a paper that comes out, it's gonna take months to years to really establish that. Um, but I'd like to thank um, all of the authors of MyFlowSiteEV who are on the call today um, for, for really putting in so much time, so much of your own time to, to helping um, everybody in the field um, to, to advance things. So Edwin and Josh, thank you again for sharing your expertise. I called this on Twitter a, a massive uh, uh, expertise download. Um, and I encourage everybody, if you have not uh, you know, engaged with these, um, with these publications, please uh, get out there and read them. And um, thanks everybody for joining today. So I hope you have a good rest of the week and I look forward to uh, seeing you again soon. Take care, everyone.